Hello everyone, welcome to the Trist. I am Parsa Mufti, and today we have with us Professor Ashok Swain, who is an academic and a professor of peace and conflict research at the Department of Peace and Conflict Research in Uppsala University. In 2017, he was appointed as the UNESCO Chair on International Water Cooperation and became the first UNESCO Chair of Uppsala University. Not only that, he has a large following on Twitter and is also an important commentator on Indian politics. Sir, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So my first question to you is, do you think India has had a formal political culture? And if so, do you, could you please uh, talk about it briefly? This depends on how far India we go and how far the history we go and look at it. Uh, but if we want to look at it, the post-independence period, of course, yeah. India uh, projected itself or India built itself as a country on three things, which we, we all know, uh, starting that with the Nehruvian ideas of uh, um, democracy, secularism, and the uh, scientific temper. Uh, those three things were extremely important, particularly the first two has a, ha have a huge significance, uh, democracy and secularism, uh, a country uh, being built uh, from uh, combining various uh, princely states and all, as well as after the independence and that's so country went through um, the um, partition. So it was a, it was a uh, it was time of consolidation, and that is the time when you needed the, or you you need all the time to keep the country together with the democracy and secularism. Those are two core principles, and also Nehru brought in because the country's uh, I mean um, was considering country was moving to the uh, in the middle of the twentieth century was a, a needed the scientific progress to match with the global ambition. So that was the scientific temper brought in also the, to, uh, to, to make the country modern um, and also to be at the global stage as a, as a progressive modern country in, in many rest, in all respects. So I think if you look at the political culture which uh, grew after the post-independence period, uh, though economically it has not been extremely successful in the beginning, of course, I mean, there has been a number of success stories. Uh, it has been also, you know, uh, raising, getting people out of poverty. There have been, of course, you can joke about the economic growth being a limited way, but the initial years, it's a country got consolidated on the basis of these three principles. And that is the political culture which India is known as, India is proud of, and India has a global recognition for those three things. So do you think in the past few years, the political culture of India has uh, changed empirically or is changing? You see, the, uh, there has been a certain move towards uh, uh, this uh, growing um, um, majoritarian uh, attitude, uh, the cost of uh, uh, all three, uh, uh, democracy, secularism, and uh, uh, the scientific temper. I think we always look at the secularism, but we need to look at it. They are all these going against these all three core principles on which India established itself as a country of repute in the world. Uh, so I think if you look at that, uh, it has been this, uh, the, the coining of the term, uh, the pseudo secular, which is uh, uh, started by uh, Advani. And then, you know, uh, since this uh, Ram Mandir movement uh, in the 90s, early 90s, uh, um, and the demolition of Babri Mosque. Uh, since then, there has been this idea of, uh, of course, there has been ups and downs. Nobody can say that India has been a perfect case on the from the very beginning. I mean, India has been up and ups and downs for some time, but it has been always sticking to those three core principles in a longer form time. But what has happened, this growing um, majoritarianism, the so-called 
um, the minority appeasement taking place at the cost of majority uh, people by the ruling class, uh, those ideas have come in for the last 30 years. So it's not new, but it has what has happened that the absolute power has come to those forces for the last eight years. And that absolute power by getting those forces, getting it, uh, they are uh, going for that so-called um, uh, a wrong and false uh, notion, which is politically becoming more relevant or more politically more fruitful for them that this kind of, uh, you know, the, getting the majority the voice and the minorities putting in their place. So this is where I think uh, the, the India has changed dramatically. And by changing that uh, political narrative, uh, that has really gone against the India's those, as I said, the very, not only the India as a nation, um, or India's unity and integrity will be, but also India's reputation as a country outside. So could you elaborate how this absolute uh, power is a threat to uh, what India is at the core and the constitutional uh, principles that we have been following? You see, the, uh, the, uh, the elections are only a small part of a democratic setup. Uh, and when in a democracy, the majoritarianism takes over, it is uh, it doesn't, it's not anymore democracy. It's a majoritarian autocracy. Uh, and the, there is, you know, uh, it is always this challenge when the populist right-wing forces take, um, take over the power on majoritarian, uh, you know, exploiting majoritarian sentiments. Uh, that makes no space for the, for the other uh, voices to rise. Uh, there is always, you know, um, it is the minorities organizing for their political benefits doesn't challenge the democracy because they will not be able to alter the political, I mean, they will not be able to capture the power completely. But when the majority comes together on the majoritarian uh, identity, forms a political mobilization, takes over the politics, then we do have a problem that there are regular uh, discussions or debates uh, which are norms and the values in, in, the, in a democratic setup, that takes, that goes away. Uh, what happens, the majoritarian values at the cost of core minority rights. Minority rights are extremely core in a democratic setup, whichever democracy, because it's a democracy's main aim is to protect those who have no, uh, you know, those, those, who are, those who are powerless. If you don't have that, that's what it, is, it, it, has, it has been that for the last eight years, it's a, in the name of electoral legitimacy. I mean, there might be questions of elections or the, whatever the manipulations, that's a separate thing. But if, even if, if there is, a, there is a, a, we accept the elections are taking place regularly, if the elections are a reflection of the popular mindset, then if these mindset are actually reflecting a majoritarian mindset, which goes, goes against acts in, in a democratic setup, taking the different ideas, different values, different perceptions, and making an accommodation. Democracy is a policy of accommodation, not for the majority to take everything. Right, sir. So in your opinion, with the replacement of uh, democratic values with majoritarian, uh, a majoritarian outlook, how do you think uh, it has affected India's foreign policy and what are the repercussions that we can see and more importantly on the immediate neighborhood? This is a very big question. I mean, you know, if you look at it, uh, but let's go step by step. First of all, uh, if you remember seven, eight years ago, or particularly when this present regime came in eight years ago almost, uh, there was this kind of euphoria of uh, the kind of new foreign policy is being uh, made. What is the new foreign policy? There are many books, many people, so-called pundits and uh, you know, Indian media, uh, Indian academics, 
they brought out the so called uh, the the modi doctrine i usually try to avoid that name but you know that doctrine was called the modi doctrine uh, i kept on asking people even though some of the you know the uh, a gujarati prof- officer uh, in the foreign ministry in us also called it modi doctrine i remember and this is something which is uh, which is uh, which was almost difficult to find out what is that the modi doctrine uh, the modi doctrine whatever it was i mean to me it didn't really look any kind of uh, clear thought out foreign policy objectives uh, because it's 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 absolutely fine if a new political dispensation comes in it ha- it it can produce, it can go for its own policy making but it must have something core values ideas in mind what it did it went in many ways to be uh, taking away the so called non aligned or neutral uh, uh, policy which india has been following or try to follow maintain a balance because between the uh, different power blocks and keeping its own voice a uh, powerful at the same time so it 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 went into directly joining in a block which is the western block or some the you know lemoa and also uh, boycotting all kinds of the, you know it's the chinese bri that's a dip, i mean it but it it is somehow technically going towards us but at the same time we invite uh, the uh, every year the g comes over or all, every alternative year g comes over to india and i was looking at a photograph today remembering that you know putting the g's uh, mask over uh, 300 or 400 uh, students of face and then uh, re- with a reception so those kind of things which was very complicated but without a thoughtless uh, strategy of what is exactly going and why this is a problem because now the last eight years policy which was moving towards uh, the west or us is moving in backward uh, on doing its policy because we didn't think about the time will come that this will be the case that you need a, a a kind of old friendship to maintain because you are you need their support uh, particularly russia's support maintaining uh security balance in the region vis-a-vis china and pakistan uh also you need russia's support whether you like it or not uh, on the kashmir issue at the in the un security council uh, those are the core things which the the regime forget that it 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 will come back and now it is at the tough time when it could have maintained a certain kind of policy for the last 8 years it is trying to undo it the other policy which which is which is uh, um because that, those are the things the lack of future thinking the other one what they did or the what the present regime did when it was actually i call it the me only foreign policy i wrote a piece in the outlook long time back in the that me only means that's modi only foreign policy means you go to a foreign country and when you go to a foreign country india had and most of the countries in the world those who are supposed to be civilized politically matured countries that in the foreign country you don't bring your own country's politics okay your country's politics politics stays home you don't take that to outside but this man went different parts of the world brought his so called uh, the hindu right wing supporters which in the diaspora called these meetings and these guys have completely no idea because they you know politics they are they they frankly if they are so much happy about india they should go back to india rather than doing all these kind of nonsense outside so they come all this this is kind of fun party they do uh, come to this and cheers for the prime minister or whoever the india's leader came in and that also what happened this this was a much more there are three different issues came out it it brought the indian politics or the internal politics externally it looked bad abroad uh, it it created also within the country 
there was the opposition has to strike back because it says that look when the india's leader is abroad because if you take our politics outside we will also criticize the second thing what happened this uh, the, 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 the 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 diaspora which was before if you look at the diaspora politics abroad uh indian diaspora uh, nehru had already told before that nehru knew nehru is much smarter guy than many other politicians uh, you know uh, so nehru had realized this problem nehru had told that once you go to other country you better be a better citizen in their country and don't try to in, you know you are okay to welcome to come and be our guest to be the don't interfere in our politics okay so the, the, that's that's something and the diaspora interfering in domestic countries politics is the most problematic thing anywhere it has happened it will i mean we have seen how the jewish diaspora intervening in the israeli politics we have seen armenian diaspora what is happening in armenia we have seen ethiopian diaspora in ethiopia we have seen tamil diaspora in sri lanka you name it i mean those you try to keep those diaspora out of internal politics but this was not done because now when your country's leader comes abroad makes politics with this certain group of diaspora the diaspora become politically engaged what are used to before the indian diaspora used to provide certain kind of support to the indian missions abroad because it's a very it's a, it's a it was getting a diaspora which has been um, earning well has been considered a good diaspora you know it doesn't involve in politics it makes money or educated those kind of things so they it was trying to like in the when the nuclear deal was signed uh, in the 2010 it was a big support for the that time government it has been always supportive of course the diaspora division started in the uh, 90s when the advani took the rath yatra but i think after that it has become uh, better even the sikh diaspora which was uh, much more difficult sometimes before it was also um, after the manmohan singh came to power it has started changing so i think there was an indian diaspora came to an uh, A, a single force of some sort of supporting uh, the indian governments in abroad what has happened with this politicization of the present prime minister the diaspora community diaspora is heavily divided there is a one vocal group which is supporting this kind of hindu majoritarianism back home uh, and they are in many ways uh, you know so kind of character sometimes they you know you you will have a problem particularly the host country you will have problems with but there is also a strong group of diaspora which used to be either silent or support the indian government has come out i mean the you name it the muslim diaspora indian muslim diaspora indian sikh diaspora indian dalit diaspora indian um, secular diaspora you name it all these groups are staying out or opposing the regime so we see a huge division sorry for this long explanation but the present regime's politics of diaspora to bring in that has divided the diaspora abroad and that is not helping the indian government or indian country as india so uh, talking about the diaspora i mean the current dispensation has seems to have a widespread support in the indian diaspora and across nations why do you think uh, that has happened i think it is somehow there are few reasons behind it it looks in one sense it looks you said widespread support but as i probably i mentioned that a widespread vocal support there is a a vocal group which are extremely selfish uh, and no uh, and usually the the you know um, it's a self driven interest uh, as well as uh, lack of uh, understanding of world and the lack of understanding of politics that brings out a, a certain groups which become vocally uh, supporting a majoritarian uh, politics in the country they forget that they 
in the their host countries are staying as a minority enjoys all the positive side of being a minority extremely insensitive about if something happens to like take for example um, if uh, the remember there was a case in the uh, mcdonald uh, french fries the beef fat was being used that became a huge issue in in united states or history books those are the things if you 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 being such a small minority in these countries and extremely sensitive about your minority rights and i am I'm, i'm absolutely fine with that i think minorities should have those rights of whatever their sensitivity needs to be protected but while you are so sensitive about your own rights as a minority you are supporting a majoritarian anti minority regime in your own home country and this is this this shows exactly how the hypocrites hypocrisy is inbuilt in those people's understanding of the politics and the culture forget about the uh, you know um, we even do don't need to i mean you can be critical of a particular uh, family or country or regime whatever that is that is something we do all have that kind of politically uh, political ideas and we think we need to do that but on which areas these people because i have i have done i i wish i would have completed that book i was doing a num- number of interviews of the uh, rich uh, powerful diaspora in the west particularly in the united states uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the bay area in california uh, looking at why they support the present regime it's it's extremely interesting if you hear that and uh, for, i mean i was doing those interviews before um i i i, I was a black uh, listed by people then people knew that i am my political view then i couldn't really follow up my interview because they know that why i'm i'm but i became more i became madder before the my book came in so i have to wait for some time now but what what are the reasons for the uh, the idea is that uh, you know um, you you will hear all kinds of stories why these people are supporting uh, this present regime nothing about making about the country is 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 a con- i mean this kind of things like you know this swachh bharat was one of the issue in 2016 i was hearing as if the country has been clean if nobody i mean as if these people don't go back they were talking about the ganges being clean as you we all know ganges is being clean for the since the rajiv gandhi times at least officially it is not yet um the, the we, we all talk about that and then finally some things comes in one i mean several people saying that they like yoga that's why they do i mean imagine these kind of people those who are making millions of dollars and i you expect them to use their brain while supporting a regime and giving these explanations so it is actually somehow uh, it's usually the diaspora usually support uh, the kind of uh, you know because it's a, it's a guilty feeling because they have come from the back so they think that they need to support back somehow uh, because you can support in a nicer way you, there is a way to support it but also some people think that anyway is supporting uh, you know at least they're contributing their country and i think majority or the, the, the vocal majority which which is doing it and also that is another thing there is a there is a strong organizational force which is working on it uh, the rss uh, international wing uh, which is uh, uh working very very strongly abroad uh, the also ruling regime bjp's international wing is also working uh, quite to there is a strong uh, monetary support coming also from india to establish uh, different uh, because the temples have become um, you know because when this young people come to a foreign country they usually go to a temple to Uh, meet because that is a kind of provide certain kind of social space also some free food in the weekend uh, i mean if you live you know uh, as a because uh, as a youngster abroad then it's it's, it's a kind of, of uh, hanging out place for the people that you don't have the are uh, not at, at least till that to acquainted with the western way of life but i think that has become a 
big uh, recruiting ground, uh, even in a country like Sweden, where oh, there, is a, there is not many people, but I think now there have been several temples which uh, are engaged, have been built and being engaged on recruiting people for these kind of uh, activities. And once you do that, that's also the peer pressure comes in. Everybody likes to do this. And take, for example, I mean, you are living outside the country. Uh, if you write anything or you say anything uh, uh, critical, then thousands or hundreds of people will be uh, stopping you or making you bad remarks. So why you want to do that? Unless you become a crazy like me. I mean, you know, you try to think so because then you probably able to, you can't stop, you, don't, you, you start giving your opinions. But looking at it, if you, if you don't really politically uh, that much engaged, probably you stay out of this. So that's why you don't see that those people are opposing it even. They are either silently, they are remaining silent or trying to avoid those kind of uh, activities. Sorry for this long uh, explanations, but I think it's, it, it, it is the, the diaspora. Diaspora, we always look at it as a single unit, but it is not. It is always in you know, a different ways it works. Right. Sir. So what would you have to say about the efforts of progressive parties in mobilizing the diaspora support in contrast to the BJP's efforts? There has been some work of the progressive parties of mobilizing the diaspora, but I think uh, the progressive parties, as I mentioned, uh, that historically, uh, particularly in uh, Nehru's time, also Indira Gandhi's time, if you look at the Congress party, and I will come to some of the, there are some communist party organizations, but they are, as in the West, is very limited. But there have been, Congress have been, engaged in, 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 in somehow some structures in the different parts of the world or mobilizing, but it has never, Congress has never given uh, that kind of uh, heart to it because uh, it, 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 it really, uh, it, it thought that it, it has never given those kind, if you look at it going back to Bajpayee's time, that is the time they made this kind of OCI stuff because and then, there, of course, Congress did engage somehow in the Gulf countries, particularly. And of course, they do have this kind of, uh, you know, the Congress of uh, overseas Congress unit in different parts of the world. But what happens? I think uh, the Congress never gave that importance to the diaspora mobilization. And I think uh, because again, as I mentioned before, I think it is a great idea. You don't engage the diaspora. Uh, into the internal politics. Of course, the, the, the Gulf countries where the diasporas are, they are not exactly, they are only going for work um, and they are, because they are Indian citizen, they come back, they're only going for short term work, they come back. But engaging the diaspora in the other parts of the world, imagine uh, it, why I say you need to keep this diaspora out because the diaspora, those who are living abroad, and if you go to these diaspora meetings, I have when I you know to you know few years, several several years ago, I went to several few meetings in the Bay Area in California uh, when this diaspora meeting the ministers and BJP leaders, always trying to ask the questions how they can do business in India. So it is not contributing to India; it is how to make money in India. The second thing is. How many diaspora have gone back to uh, uh, India? Uh, there was a process which was going on um, in the when India's economy was doing better. India was becoming much and more progressive, getting more. Uh, that was the period, uh, you know, last decade uh, which was working 2004 to 2000 to 14, 13, 14. But then people are coming back. Those who had gone, several of people. So I think that the, the issue is becoming more difficult there. So, but if you look at, if you are a diaspora, you give explanations why you have left the country. You know, there is always this question, oh, you know, why you have gone abroad, working abroad. Then you either blame the reservation system in India because you say, oh, there is a reservation. We didn't get the job. I mean, those are the things, you, you know, as if that's, that's the, so if you, if you ask a diaspora, it's a very easy that to blame it on the reservation policy, or blame it onto the minority appeasement policy. So that's why we are here. 
So, so it is always to find some fault back home. That's why to justify that we are living abroad, despite we are so patriotic, okay? How you justify being patriotic, being living abroad? You need to put some fault that you are at home. And that's why you are, you are, you are doing it. And I think for, for this kind of diaspora, it is always, uh, they, if, if the country prospers or country does well, they don't feel good about it. Because why they don't feel good about it? Because this is, this is where they find, I, I think, a psychological satisfaction of being successful in abroad. And when they, in the comparison to their relatives, their family or their villagers or their net, you know, the acquaintances, they can show up that they are doing so good here. So if they do well, these kind of characters will have problems. So I think it's a very complicated cycle of the diaspora story uh, of uh, how to engage them in internal politics. And I think, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm happy and grateful rather the progressive parties haven't done gone to this process because diaspora should be kept out of the internal politics as much as possible. And uh, the way um, that is the good thing that you don't in, engage them, but to engage them against country's core values, core principles, against country's democracy, against country's human rights values, against country's the scientific temper, that is criminal. And that's what happening. Sir, coming to my last question, uh, after the uh, recent uh, elections, state elections in India, BJP seems to be, uh, continue to be the party of choice for Indians. And even though its uh, vote share has declined, uh, it's still winning. What are the progressive parties not doing? What do they need to do to get back on track? And if not win, then at least be considered a healthy competition to the BJP. Excellent question. Um, I think uh, there are three things here. One, we need to look at it because everybody thinks that uh, there is this, uh, uh, the present uh, leader in India as if a political magician, magician or politically completely, uh, but even Trump can win in the United States. What has happened in the ongoing present politics all over the world, in the West, also in Europe, you see these kind of right-wing populist megalomaniacs are actually getting much better political support. And they, because they, and why, they, why it is that? Because they try to reflect the kind of things which they want to say that people want to hear uh, and also finding fault, creating a narrative of an enemy which will be blamed for other things, their failures. In which other country, thousands of people die without oxygen, hundreds of people float in the river because they could not be cremated because of the government. I mean, the regime couldn't really provide even cremation. I mean, that's the a society in the 21st century, the basic thing is to at least to respect when a person is dead, okay? And that we don't do it, but then we bring that back to the power, how that happens. So it is nothing that that's what, that the politically, some things, the, somebody is smarter than others, but the politically they're using the language or the tactic which the other parties are either unable ideologically will able to do it because it's, a, it's a particularly ideologically or humanly, you can do those kind of things. So that, that is one thing we need to realize, I think just to, because this is the kind of image making which is going on as if uh, in the 1.4 billion people in the 72 years, at, they have found only one guy who can fool 101.4 billion, billion people. That's not the case. The case is it's a global problem which is taking place. The second thing is what exactly the opposition party can do. I think what is the, this is the time you need to, uh, there are two ways. 
either a shortcut way is that you cre create a coalition, uh, you're creating a coalition just to grab power back. Uh, and you grab the power back, then you also, um, what you call it, you uh, accommodate and also compromise with a lot of ideology. Uh, you compromise with a lot of principles. You also compromise a number of people in this context. Then you create an, a coalition or alliance to go together to fight that majoritarian forces uh, in the immediate term. I, I, I mean, again, of course, being I'm not, I mean, you know, being I'm outside, I wouldn't prefer that. But if I'm in the country, I'm going through this putting this probably I say immediately I probably need some kind of support you know people countries to, people need to come together the third thing which is important that you stick to the core ideology on which the country is established and country is uh, proud of and country needs to follow it needs to remain as a country and country of uh, repute and country of civilizations in the 21st century so if you want to keep to that core force one that is because all these kind of forces, these kind of uh, populist, authoritarian, right, or either left-wing or right-wing forces, they usually take a downward turn after some time. It is never always, they always keep on winning. It is a matter of time when the people will realize it's, it's a taking longer, it's a, it, it takes a bit longer. It's not that, you know, it's a magic which goes on like, you know, after five years, you keep changing, even US, after five years, the four years, they changed the, you know, it's only 100,000 votes. If you look at the key states, Trump got defeated, but Trump has now, Trump's uh, political action committee has more money than the Republican and the Democrats put together. And he's a huge political force still. So these kind of forces don't go away easily. But if you are going towards uh, sticking to your ideology, sticking to the core values, uh, fighting for it, there is a time which will come that you will win. And that for that, a country needs to, unfortunately, several countries are going through a very terrible phase of how to adjust to this kind of situation. But I think it's in, in, in this context, I do see really the, I blame rather the civil society than the political uh, parties of, because it's a, it's a very fashionable uh, thing by the, so India's uh, intellectual or whatever the commentators they are, to put a blame on one political party or one political leader uh, is the most easiest thing to do. But I think the, the question is, uh, is that the question, the answer? No, because I think the, you, if uh, fighting for a particular value, particular uh, principle for which the, con the party has fought since its beginning, and if you stick to that, that is not exactly a wrong thing to do. And that is not a wrong thing to stick to for, for the future. Thing. What has happened here that we see the civil society, which I thought has, has much more um, uh, energy or much more strength, uh, particularly what it, we have seen that in the before, that has compromised. And the civil society by not really playing its role has given this kind of unfortunate uh, power to a, a regime which is majoritarian, anti-democratic, and anti-science uh, in, uh, in all together. And that is showing that why opposition parties or the main opposition party hasn't been successful yet. Uh, but I think it's a matter of time uh, and that the blame goes to the um, not only political parties, I think the more than that, the civil society. Right, sir. You raised some very pertinent points today. The most important one being, can one political party really be blamed if the collective consciousness of an entire nation has been corrupted? Thank you, sir, for joining us today. It was a pleasure to interview you. It's my pleasure, too. Thank you.